It gives me great pleasure to introduce Ben Lin as our next keynote speaker. Uh, ben has flown in, flown in all the way from the US to give this talk. I'm really happy. Thank you very much, Ben. Yeah. Yeah, so I know Ben actually from his blog, um, where he talks about Haskell, Lambda Calculus, Git. For some reason, whenever I used to look on the internet for this, Google always pointed me to his blogs. And so I was like, oh, cool. I, I was thinking it'd be nice to invite him over here. Yeah? And then I asked him, yeah, can you be a speaker at Zurihack? And he told me, I actually have a poor background in functional programming. Uh, would it be okay? if I just talked about how I wrote my own Haskell compiler. <laughs> and yeah, so after that sec fault in my brain, I, I was like, okay, what's happening? And, and yeah, so, so we're here now. And, um, and then later I understood what he meant because another colleague of mine came up to me, so someone from computer security came up to me and said that Ben Lin is giving a talk at Zurihack. What, what's, he, what's he doing here? And then he told me that he's actually a superstar in the cryptography world. And I was like, oh, cool. So I'm really, I'm really happy. <laughs> People have parallel lives in this community. Yeah, so it's cool. Yeah, anyway, uh, so Ben's going to be talking about uh, a Haskell compiler and how you can do it in uh, two minutes. So for those, for those of you who, uh, who were there for the GHC workshop, where we spent three days, and we even spent, I don't know, 20 years now. So I hope this is not going to be too sad for us. But... <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's cool. And so yeah, I look forward to your talk and I hope uh, one day I can also say I have a poor, as poor a background in functional programming as you do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. <laughs> See you. Well, thanks very much, Farad, and also thank you very much for suggesting the title of this talk, because um, I had no idea what to call it. And. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do want to say I, I really don't know that much about functional programming. It's, um, as I studied cryptography, and um, I just you know follow along free free stuff I find online to do what I do. And um, so let's uh, yeah. And so given my background or, or lack of it, I, I thought I'd, I'd position this talk more as light entertainment. And I'm going to start with some magic tricks. So I hope you like those. Um, so first, I'd like you to pick a Boolean expression, any any Boolean expression, and. Um, was this the one you thought of? Uh, uh, no, well, that's okay. This isn't a mind reading trick. It's actually a, a vanishing act. And so I want you to watch very closely. Well, get closer. It isn't, oh, I should have had it brought a magic wand or something. And, um, and look, the logic symbols have disappeared, and yet the Boolean expression has kept its meaning. Um, and so, judging by the lack of astonished gasps, I can only surmise that you've, you all know how this trick works. And that's uh, um, it's NAND. It's, um, I've, I've used. I've denoted NAND with juxtaposition, and using some ancient rules, we can rewrite any Boolean expression so that every operation is, is just NAND. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, for instance, A or B, you can rewrite as not A, NAND, not B, and then in turn, these not A, you can write as A, NAND, A. In other words, NAND is functionally complete. And apparently, this, this, uh, the dual of this trick was used in the first moon landing. Like the Apollo guidance computer only had one type of gate on it. It was a, a three-input NOR gate. And they did that deliberately, I guess, because back then, um, the, the hardware was a bit more primitive. And then to maximize reliability, they wanted to standardize on one kind of gate that they could test extensively and be sure that it would work in the extremes of space. Um, and even though this is a very simple trick that you all know, uh, it's, it's already, <laughs> we already run into a very thorny issue, and that's one of sharing. So the formula, not A, it rewrites as A NAND A, that kind of suggests duplication. But, but, then, but would you take a circuit A and then rebuild the circuit A and then take both inputs and put them into a NAND gate? No, you, of course not. You, you would, any engineer would take the output wire, split it in two, and then feed it into a NAND gate. In other words, they would share the input. And uh, this is something that uh, we, we've actually, I mean, Simon mentioned this on, on Saturday, that um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to, to 
to depict the true heap usage in an expression. And, and here we run into this problem. So we have the, the nice, beautiful tree on top the, we, with, with plenty of duplication, but that's kind of not really what happens. And what really happens is we, we share inputs, and um, I've sort of used the funny notation to denote that. I've got these numbers that, that uh, correspond to bits of circuits, and then it's, um, hopefully you can follow along and see how they're shared. And <clears throat> Um, and yeah, I'm afraid I don't have a good solution for this. Throughout this talk, I'm going to switch between those two depending on when it's important. And you just have to bear in mind that it's not the, the top clean one is not always the truth. I mean, it's got a lot more duplication than what's really happening. And sharing is a, is a, it comes up everywhere in computer science. And because of that, it has many different names like uh, lazy evaluation, common sub-expression elimination, the flyweight pattern, um, automatic differentiation, and so on. Which I think is really funny because of all optimization techniques, you would expect this one to have a unique name. <laughs> anyway, moving on, let's, let's do another magic trick. So this time, we're going to do higher order logic formulas. So recall, these are just Boolean expressions, but this time you can have uh, functions, predicates, variables, and those variables can be quantified. Uh, you can put for all, all there exists in front of these variables. And again, there's nothing on my sleeve. Oh, oh yeah, and just to be, uh, <laughs> and this is the, perhaps the most famous logic formula on earth. We have a celebrity volunteer here. And it's, it sort of represents um, John Stuart Mill's famous example, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. And um, being a Haskell conference, I don't need to put parentheses, cause, um, and, and, <laughs> and, and we have currying if there were multiple arguments, but we don't in this example. And once again, there's nothing up my sleeve, and I'm going <laughs> to make all the logic symbols disappear once again. <laughs> wow, tough crowd. <laughs> so how did I do this trick? And well, maybe not, no, one, no one's um, impressed because it's just a variant of the previous trick. It's a uni universally quantified NAND. So if I write x dot a b for, for all x, a NAND b, then um, there's a set of rewrite rules that Schoenfinkel um, found in 1920, which can <clears throat> translate any higher order logic formula so that it only uses that one construction. So now that we know how this trick works, let's, let's do it again. And our next volunteer is this uh, kind of funny looking higher order function, uh, higher order formula. And yeah, we can, as, as I've just shown, we can rewrite it with uh, universally quantified NANDs. But we can do more than that. And again, I like to watch very carefully. And the variables have vanished. <laughs> <laughs> and then, although I haven't defined what these U, S, and B constants are, perhaps it's a bit surprising that with just a bunch of parentheses and these three constants, you can sort of represent the same information. Like the other one has all these uh, funny symbols in it and variables. Um, so let's uh, dig into this some more. Um, and first of all, one, uh, uh, there's a sort of annoying step. It's this, uh, this U thing. The U doesn't help at all. It's just. It's more of a notational device. It, instead of our funny dot notation, it, let, it lets us write a logic formula in, in, a, in a lambda term. And as you can see, it even blows up the size of, of the thing we're trying to represent. So, so U isn't really helping here. It just lets us write it as a lambda term. And the real secret is in the other two, S and B. And these are combinators. A, a combinator is a cleverly chosen function. And in this case, we've cleverly chosen S and B, which are given by those equations. And it turns out there's something called a, a bracket abstraction algorithm, which can rewrite any lambda term in terms of combinators. So it gets rid of all the variables. And perhaps some of you can do in your head, can check in your head that uh, this evaluates the same as that, right? <laughs> now, probably, but for the rest of us, we, 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 we'll have to use simple examples. So um, luckily, we, I've prepared one right here. So suppose you're in an emergency situation, and you really need to build an identity function, but all you have in your pocket are a bunch of S and K combinators. So what do you do? I mean, uh, S and K are given by those equations, and as you probably recognize them in Haskell, like K is just a const function, and S is the reader instance of app, and you, you want to connect them together somehow to build an identity function. And maybe it doesn't look that hard. I mean, identity is simple. You get an X, return an X, and the K function already returns an X. We just have to figure out how to uh, deal with the Y part of it. And maybe you can like just snap together a const and a const. And, um, but if you, but if, if you play around with this a little, it's not as easy as it seems, because if you try const, const, but kkx evaluates to k, because it 
drops the second argument, not the first one. And then you, if only you could somehow tell K to, to um, evaluate the arguments in the opposite order, you could do it, but we don't, I didn't give you the C combinator, the, well, well, AKA flip in Haskell. And so it's, it's um, not that as, as easy as it seems. And, um, but the solution is, uh, there is actually a pretty short solution, and pretty well known, and it's uh, people say SKK, even though you can actually replace the, third, the second K with anything you like. And uh, you can check using those rules that we really do get the identity function. SKKX evaluates to K of X applied to K of X, and then K drops its second argument, and you just end up with X. And, and then the Haskell equivalent is app const const. So any time you have an ID function in your code, you can replace it with app const const. And I'm sure your code reviewer will love it. <laughs> 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 well, you get style points. I don't know if it's <laughs> um, so. Uh, so, uh, so we've seen that you can. It's possible that you can build functions that you've uh, just by cleverly choosing functions. You can build ones that you you haven't defined. So in this case, we from S and K, we have built the identity function, and which raises a question: What else can you build from S and K? And the answer to that is everything. So S and K are Turing complete. And um, just like we had rewrite rules before to transform any formula into a, to just to use NAND, we can use these rules to transform any lambda term so it only uses S and K. And so what I've done there is I took the, um, where is it, this guy. Yeah, I took this, uh, the lambda term representation of the formula and I, use those three rewrite rules to turn it into this monstrosity. And obviously, when I showed the trick, I didn't do that. I, I, uh, it's a much smaller answer. I used a different bracket abstraction algorithm there. It's a, it's a really clever one and, and, and much better, but I don't know if I'll have time to talk about it, but I will if, I, if there's time at the end. And, um, and I just, oh, and the second thing you do is, uh, this U business, you can just get, that U is only there for notational reasons, it's just connected to logic, and we can get rid of that by simply prepending lambda U, applying bracket abstraction, like using those S and Ks, and <clears throat> so in other words, you can, uh, and then that gets rid of the U's. So in other words, you can write any logic formula with just S and K, which was uh, Schoenfinkel's main result in 1920. Um, and so the underst uh, the, the, uh, it's understood that if you give this, this bunch of S and Ks to someone, they're going to apply it to you first and then try and interpret it as a logic formula. Oh, yes. Uh, so you can also um, define an even more complicated co combinator called X. It sort of combines S and K. And then it turns out K is X of X and S is X of K. And then you can then rewrite all your Ks and S's in terms of this single combinator X. <laughs> which is a bit silly, but we can be even sillier and write X as a pair of parentheses, and, so the <laughs> and now your whole program is just a beautiful binary tree. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, or if you don't like Lisp, you can remove the parentheses and with the prefix operator, and um, you get the same sort of thing. But now you need a, a, the application operator and the X combinator. And so, um, in summary, combinators are kind of the ultimate building blocks. Ju just as NAND was functionally complete and can generate all Boolean expressions, we've just seen that S and K are Turing complete. They, they, they can generate any lambda term. And um, yeah, for me, it was actually a bit confusing learning about these things because they, they, they call this combinatorial logic, so I thought it was kind of related to logic. And that's where they came from. But you don't have to uh, you think about logic at all. You just can just think of them as building blocks of lambda calculus, so building blocks of computation. And by chance, um, I'll be talking about uh, the, the, well, the common names I happen to use spell out the word bricks. Uh, well, there's a few more too, which is really appropriate for building blocks. Because if you try and use S, just the S and K common names by themselves, um, you'll soon regret it. <laughs> and um, not only are they theoretically uh, good building blocks, but in practice, you can see they're really, they're really good building blocks because it's so easy to write code for them. This is an excerpt from a, um, a program I have that uh, reduces combinators, expressions. And as you can see, it's just a, uh, just a like one line each for each combinator. Um, and there's some primitives for inter-arithmetic and things. And if you're curious, they're the Haskell equivalents of the BRICS combinators. Um, they're, they're all very simple seeming functions, and yet they generate any lambda term. Um, 
And the combinators are also the original building blocks. So as I said, Moses Schoenfinkel invented them in 1920, and, um, and Haskell Curry rediscovered them in 1926. And the other competing models of computation, such as lambda calculus and Turing machines, they, they, they came later. I mean, they're not even a century old yet. So it, it's kind of funny that they're more well known and the original one, um, I don't know, I feel like it's not as well known. And um, I would have loved to say that what I just shown was all shown Finkel in 1920, but the real history is way more messy, but it's really fun to look at though. Um, for instance, his, he didn't even write his own paper. Someone else sort of wrote it for him and added his own ideas, which, one of which was wrong, and they didn't actually publish the bracket abstraction algorithm, but he sort of hand-waved his way through a demo. And, um, and in 1925, John, Voigt, John von Neumann also published something that was a bit like combinators, and it was unclear if he knew about Schoen Finkel's work or not. And he also had a sort of theorem where he talked about, he said, oh, you can do bracket abstraction, but it's easy, so I'm not going to talk about it. Because it wasn't his main focus, which is fair enough. <laughs> and um, so ultimately, it's not, Curry gets the credit for the first published bracket abstraction algorithm, um, but he didn't use S and K. And for that, we, there's a, um, I think it was kind of well known in the research community, you could do it with S and K, but it wasn't actually written down on paper, um, published until 1950. So it's, uh, <laughs> so it's, a, it's kind of a fun story. To, um, um, there's a great paper on all of this stuff. And here's a, um, a screenshot of the original paper, which is, is quite readable. Well, um, well, I can't read German, so the one on the right for me. But, uh, and as you can see, it's building blocks of logic. So that's, um, that's how they originally in, envisioned, combina envisioned combinators. And halfway down the page, um, in sort of archaic notation, you might recognize the volunteer from the magic trick. And at the bottom is um, uh, the, the same uh, re reduction that I got, uh, this, uh, except uh, they did it by hand and I used an algorithm. And, um, and historically, um, people have known this. Uh, so uh, Haskell have, uh, is a, comes from a, a long line of um, languages based on lambda calculus. And a lot of the compilers for those languages use combinators, I think. I, I got this from online, so, but hopefully people in the room can confirm this. <laughs> and uh, um, they use bracket abstraction algorithms to, to take their lambda terms and put them in, write them into, as combinators, which are really easy to interpret. And then for a long time, um, functional programming languages uh, compilers did this. Uh, but then, um, I, I don't know the exact dates, I, I, I'm guessing in the 90s, uh, GHC encountered some issues with the combinators, and at first they tried to super combinators, which are like tailor-made combinators for each program, and, uh, the, and hopefully they, they can still get things fast enough. But eventually they abandoned com combinators altogether and for STG. Um, but then in 2018, uh, I came across a paper published by Oleg Kizlyov about a new bracket abstraction algorithm. And here, there he says, maybe combinators deserve a second look. For, and um, yeah, so let's, let's take a look. <clears throat> but first, let me, uh, I, I don't just do magic tricks, I also do death-defying stunts. So I'd, I'd, <laughs> so I'd like to um, take care of a claim I made in the title. Uh, and this is really dangerous. Don't try this at home. Uh, oh, yeah, it didn't work. Okay, definitely don't try this. I don't know why. Oh, I know why. I forgot to enable the, the browser extension I needed. <laughs> um, oh, no. Okay, hang on a second. Uh, I'll just have to swap Windows. Um, I should have tested this beforehand. Um, oh, while well, that's loading, maybe I'll do a... Wait, let me just check this works. The problem is I need to get a terminal window in the browser, which I have an extension for. Oh yeah, it works in this window. Okay, so let me just close you, and then um, open this guy here. And can I move this to that screen? Yeah, okay. And then, okay, now I've got a, um, I can get a terminal here. Is that legible? No, okay. <laughs> let me boost the font size. Oops, I don't want a new. <laughs> How do I get the font size bigger in this? Is it? Something like that. Um, uh, that's probably more readable. All right. Um, okay. So you can follow along at home. Actually, I, I, I did say don't try this at home, but you can. It's it's uh, it shouldn't blow up your system. And let's just uh, make a Siri uh, hack directory um, and then git clone. What did I? Gee, I hope this repository works. I only made it yesterday. <laughs> And this part of the time doesn't count. This is the network speed. This, and, <laughs> and here we go. 
So I'm going to, I have a, um, for silly, I, I name my compilers in a really silly scheme, it's called Precisely, and, and off we go. Uh, in the meantime, this will take a little while, so I, I, only, I, I, I do death for firing stunts, but I also do them in parallel. So we're going to go to a second window, where I'm going to try some live coding here with combinators. And um, let's do a simple expression to start with. So S, A, B, C, how's that going to, is that legible? Let's zoom in a bit. Uh, uh, oh, that's probably too big. Okay, and you might recall <clears throat> the rule for SABC, it's AC to uh, B of C. So let me slow down the evaluation speed. This visualizes reductions. Uh, I, I built this for this talk, actually. <laughs> and there's a, a sort of tooltip at the top that explains what's going on. And um, so I've, I've uh, connected the tops and bottoms of matching parentheses, so they sort of form nested bubbles, and I, I think it's a really cute visualization. Um, if you don't like it, just go like that, and then you'll cover the tops and bottoms, and it'll be the parentheses again. <laughs> and uh, just to show you what the, just get a, so you get a feel for how these things act, I'm gonna type in some random programs like, uh, I don't know, um, Bricks, Bricks, um, Hello, Zuri Hack. Uh, yeah, oops, I can't spell it. Coding's hard, okay. And then, come on, where'd my mouse go? Yeah. There, okay, that's, that's good enough, okay. <laughs> and so this is evaluating in normal order, which means only the left bubble is ever considered. And when, when, a, when a big bubble reaches the left, it, it pops, and then we start evaluating the stuff on the inside. And each one takes as much arguments as it needs and um, applies them to the rest of the stuff. And, uh, um, <laughs> I, and once again, we run into the problem with sharing. So um, to keep the visualization simple, simple, and also because I didn't get around to implementing it, uh, <laughs> we, we don't do any sharing here. So this is normal order evaluation. And it's a bit unfair, because in my compiler, I, I do do sharing. And so sometimes you'll see big bubbles get copied around, and the same computation get done again, when, it, when actually that's not the case. Um, yeah, so I, I, I have no idea what this program does, but it looks like... <laughs> but it is following the rules, and, and it sort of gives you a flavor of, of, of how the combinators work. I'll put in a more serious program. So this one... Um, I, oh, wait a minute, it's a bit hard to see. Okay, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with combinators, but uh, can anyone guess what this might do? <laughs> Victoria. Hey, who said that? How did you know? How, how, how did you guess that? Yes, yes, very good. The Y, the, okay, this is foreshadowing, but the Y does um, recursion, and then the, there's a less than one check, and the multiplication, and the, and the subtraction from one. And then, and then, and then and yeah, it's computing four factorial. I'm gonna let it play so you can see how, um, you can see what these things look like when they're, when they're evaluating. And, and this is unfair, this shouldn't be copying this bubble. This is a shared bubble. But that's, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I did come up with a visualization for sharing, but I, I didn't have time to implement it. Um, here, let's make it a bit faster. This will take a while because it's gonna repeat some computations. So let me, uh, that's about a good speed, I think. Um, and in the meantime, oh no, I don't want to, no, I want to keep it playing, it's very pretty. <laughs> and so even if you don't quite get the, the guts of combinators, you can kind of see each of them is individually very simple. It's, it's sort of like an assembly language instruction, and you really can do arbitrary computations with it. Um, okay, I've, I've had a, uh, let's make it even faster, because <laughs> uh, the timing will be wrong. And once again, it's subtract repeatedly subtracting one from four, even though with sharing, you would only do that once and then save the results somewhere else where we would come back. I mean, a Andres spoke about this stuff yesterday, so um, yeah. <laughs> so maybe it's just as well, I didn't visualize it here. And there we have 24. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And this is finished too, and it took one minute and 17 seconds. And to test this compiler, I'm gonna build a compiler, but I'm gonna build um, a, a interactive, a REPL version of my compiler. And unfortunately, this will take a bit more time, um, uh, for like 30 seconds or so. So I got a time for more programs here, uh, I, but I didn't have one. I had one in mind, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, I just wanted to show that uh, SKKX does indeed, um, oh, whoops, zoom the other way, please, and then, Speed down. Is SKKX is indeed the identity combinator. Um, so at the top we have the tooltip showing what each combinator does, and um, yeah, you get SKKX is X, and 
And uh, the other thing I said before was you can replace the third argument. Uh, instead of SKK, you can do SK anything. So, uh, because the K combinator will, um, will kill the second argument, so to speak. And yeah, that will just fade away, and you're left with X. And oh, and this is finished, and we can test that it's, it worked. Um, oh, well, uh, like, I don't know. For what I th um, <laughs> <laughs> I should have thought about this more. I don't know what's a cool way to test the Haskell compiler. Uh, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, factorial, yeah. Factorial, okay. Uh, that's a good idea. Fact factorial n equals uh, if. So yeah, the program I had before, um, we're going to be sick of this example by the end, by the way. And, um, else one, I should do the trick, right? And then, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, okay, wow, thank you. I didn't expect the pause here, but thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so let's get back to some of how the, the nuts and bolts of how I built this. Um, so a compiler can be, as a, a, a first approximation, you can think of it as a pipeline from, from a, that takes a string, then it returns an abstract syntax tree, and then it type checks that syntax tree, possibly adding to it, because um, for type classes you need to insert dictionaries here and there. And then we convert that syntax tree into a lambda term, and, la and finally we, we uh, use bracket abstraction to change the lambda term in, into combinators, which, um, well, as we've seen, uh, uh, even uh, uh, you can run with a pretty simple VM. And so the first part of this talk was about bracket abstraction, and I, I even showed a, a full bracket abstraction algorithm, but that's not the one I use because it's terrible. And, and so now I'd like to focus on the, the second last step. Um, so in, in this whole, yeah, normally you would also care about errors and things like that, but yeah, I'm not, not, not for this talk. So into lambdas, how do we squeeze Haskell into these three constructions? Uh, where, um, where, so a lambda term is either a variable, a lambda abstraction, or an application, which, uh, yeah, I, I guess I don't need to tell this crowd. And, and uh, a lot of the, the Haskell is really easy to convert to lambdas. Like, um, Peter Landon called his language Church Without Lambda because it was just an alternative way of writing Lambda in his, in his mind. Like if you see a function definition like this, all you have to do is move the arguments from the left side to the right side and put a Lambda in front of it, and then you have a Lambda term. Um, similarly, a, a let is just a syntax sugar for a Lambda abstraction applied to a term. But what about data, ty data types and, and case expressions and recursion and, and mutual recursion? I mean. Like data is tricky because it doesn't look like anything like a, a function, like, like a lambda term. And the problem with recursion and mutual recursion is that this such a simple thing, like uh, with variables, lambdas, and applications. There's no, it doesn't seem there's a way for them to point to things that haven't been defined yet or, or point to yourself. So, uh, that, so those two, I mean, I guess these things were, were I found most challenging about writing, um, that I had to think the most about when I was writing this compiler. And, so let's focus on data first. So how do we turn a data type into a lambda term? Um, so suppose we have some definition of a data type here, and, um, and then those of you who attended Andres' Andres talk yesterday will know the answer to this. What, what is the only meaningful, meaningful thing we can do with a data value? Um, exactly, case analysis. And, <clears throat> And so that's, that's the only time, otherwise we're just passing the value from function to function. And the only time we actually do something is a, with it is when it, it encounters a case expression. And it's going to look something like this. Um, you, you figure out which one of those data constructors is, it is, and then you apply um, the, the appropriate function. And that doesn't sound like a, a big thing to say, but in fact it, it, uh, it sort of motivates the solution really well, I think. because. It, it, first, you just, uh, well, yeah, let's take that case statement, and then, well, it's not a lambda term. Well, let's just force it into a lambda term somehow. And then the way to do that is we delete the keywords we don't know how to handle, how to handle and we don't delete the data constructors, we don't know what those are. And, and then um, the rest of it kind of looks like a lambda expression. And so we get this, and then it is a lambda term. Scrutinized value is value applied to three uh, lambdas. And then the Scott encoding of a data type is whatever you need to do to make that work. And, then, and that's how you encode data and case expressions as lambda terms. Um, so for, as an example here, this unknown data type, unknown 42b, takes three functions and runs the third function on 42 and b, because it'll correspond to the, the third case of the case expression. And um, here's some more examples. If, uh, <laughs> um, 
Oh yeah, maybe this isn't a good slide. Like if, unless you're really familiar with this technique, it's not going to be obvious. But the, the, uh, F and G, when it, when X's and Y's sort of correspond to the, field, the, the fields of the data constructor, and F and G are the various case matches. Um, and uh, it's Booleans, I would prefer true and false were swapped around, but uh, way back in the day, Church described it in one way, and that's the way we've, uh, people have said it ever since. And I'm, I, I, I'll get confused if I switch it around now. Um, and the reason I, I do prefer it the other way is because uh, false co sort of corresponds to zero and true corresponds to one, so false should go first, not true. But any, anyway, and, and, it's the, that's, and it's the, that's the way it is for the other similar things, like nothing goes first, the empty list goes first, and, um, and, and so on. And, and piano arithmetic zero will, will go first instead of the successor function. And now we come to um, mutual recursion. Uh, so, so we've handled data types and case expressions. Let, let's look at recursion and mutual recursion. <laughs> so suppose you have uh, um, two mutually recursive functions. And it's, it's unclear how to convert these to lambda terms because you, you pick one. You pick the chicken, and then you start turning to a lambda term, and then you encounter this egg thing. And you can, you can maybe say, OK, well, I'll go look up the definition of egg. And you start converting that as well and maybe inlining it. And then you run into chicken. And you say, well, I haven't finished defining chicken yet. And then and you end up in trouble. But actually, the solution is quite simple. Uh, you just use uh, placeholders. So you sort of define a, a, a proto-chicken, which it's just almost like a chicken, but it, but it has a, an extra argument. And if that argument were to be filled with an egg, then it would be a chicken. So, <laughs> so I, I've somehow managed to define a sort of chicken without mentioning eggs. <laughs> so once I've de defined this proto-chicken, and then I, I can now define an egg. I can say, well, an egg is just a proto-chicken where I pass it myself. <laughs> And then once you have the egg, now you can define a chicken. So, um, and so by doing that, we, we've reduced mutual recursion to single recursion. And this is um, something we actually do subconsciously every day. Uh, because in natural languages, uh, we often start a sentence with a word, uh, with a word like it. We, and we say, um, oh, yeah, yeah, it takes one to no one. And then, well, if, you, if I just stopped at it takes one, you have no idea what it means or one means, for that matter. And it's only when you hear the rest of the sentence that you go back and fill in the meaning. <clears throat> and, uh, but, it, but interestingly, in natural language, they don't do that because they're trying to avoid mutual recursion. It's, it just sounds better. <laughs> I mean, you can't say to no one takes one. And that, that would just confuse people. <laughs> And uh, that's the, so in, in general, you may, multiple, may need multiple placeholders. So here's an example um, uh, with, with four mutually recursive functions. And it's a weird species of butterfly, because I, I had to make the various life stages interact with each other, otherwise the example would be too trivial. So uh, <laughs> I just had to come up with random verbs. <laughs> and, uh, but you can see that the solution is the same. You, pick, you arbitrarily pick one to define first, in this case, the larva. And the proto-lava is given three placeholders for the other life cycles. We haven't defined them yet, but it, 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 has, it can kind of access them through these uh, placeholders. And it's a bit more complicated, because now you have, sometimes you have to pass placeholders to placeholders. And as you're defining these things, uh, as you define more and more things, you use fewer and fewer placeholders, because more stuff is now defined. And, um, uh, yeah, it's not the sort of thing you can sort of, I don't think you can learn from a slide while sitting down. You just have to, uh, you just have to go through it. But, it's, but, but the main point is you, you, you need multiple placeholders, and you may need to pass placeholders to placeholders to get this done. Um, and by the way, you can also, uh, this also suggests an alternative strategy for uh, compiling let expressions. So if you have a let expression deep in some scope, you can lift them all the way to the top by, tr by treating any um, variables they need as, as, uh, as with play you can, by using placeholders. And, and, and then that way, let f um, any let fun definition just becomes an ordinary function. Um, and then when you do that, that's called lambda lifting. But, um, but my compiler doesn't do that. It, ju it just does that uh, transformation we saw before where it, um, oh, well, let me show you. Uh, there, the, that, the, the second transformation over here. Because um, I didn't want to write lambda lifting code. And so that leaves us with just the, the single recursive case. So, um, so let's take a recursive function such as the Fibonacci numbers. <clears throat> And then we might try what we did before, which is we, we uh, add a placeholder, x, and every, where we normally would have needed um, something that was undefined, we, we put x. So we have x of n goes to, if, uh, well, the, the important part is the, the calls. So x of n of minus 1 and x of n minus 2. And 
um, your first instinct, well, at least my first instinct was, well, then I, then I can just define Fibonacci's numbers by placing this proto-Fibonacci function into itself, right? And, but then if you do that, you get the wrong, <clears throat> you get the wrong right-hand side, because now you get Fib1 of n minus 1 and Fib1 of n minus 2. And that's... And recall, these aren't, this isn't the Fibonacci function. This is the proto-Fibonacci function. It, it's got a pla it expects a placeholder somewhere. So um, you actually have to uh, double up the placeholder, so to speak. You have to pass placeholders to placeholders. And it's, it's all kind of confusing. But really, it's the same as um, back over here, where you have to place placeholders to placeholders uh, and the, uh, <clears throat> for the same reason. It's just somehow it's more confusing when there's only one function. And so once you know this, it's not too bad. All you have to do is um, go on the right-hand side, and everywhere you see an x, just replace it with two x's, like that. And um, so the Fibiaki function is, is where I've done that. And now you, you can define the Fibonacci numbers as Fibiaki passed to itself. Um, and this works, but it's actually a headache to construct because now you have to walk through an AST and find where the recursive calls are and then double them up with placeholders, and, and that's kind of annoying. And worse still, it duplicates XX. Like, we're, we're all about sharing and lazy evaluation. I mean, we shouldn't be computing X of X twice. So a better way to do it is to keep the, the original Fib1 function we had before, the, the sort of proto-recursive function, and, and then do the, the yucky part in, in, a, in a separate function. So the fib2 is the one that will pass the placeholder to itself, and then it works. Now you just pass the second, the yucky version to itself. And, and by doing so, we, we've magically eliminated recursion. Each of these things uh, it doesn't need itself to uh, uh, Sorry, each of these things only depends on stuff that's already been fully defined, if you look closely. And of course, I've chosen the Fibonacci numbers as an example, but this technique works in general. Um, and you may have recognized it. Um, some of you may recognize it. It's, it's called the Y Combinator. So um, the, the, the technique for making stuff recursive is just uh, passing this uh, placeholder doubling function to itself. And when, when you write it out in full, it looks like that. Um, and when, and when I first saw the Y Combinator, I had no idea why it worked. But then when I, but when I went through Curry's papers, it, it made more sense. Um, and it was first published by Rosenblum in 1950, but I, I would argue that Curry himself was kind of a Y Combinator, because you could give him an almost recursive function, and he would know how to turn it into a recursive function by carrying out the actions of a Y Combinator. He would, he would, he would <laughs> define a second function to apply placeholders to themselves, and then apply that function to itself. So I think if you asked him, can you write down what you're doing in terms of a lambda expression, he would have, he would have written down a Y Combinator, but he didn't, and so uh, Rosenblum gets the credit. Um, um, oh, yes. <laughs> so to recap, uh, we, we started with a, a function that's almost recursive. So we, we, can't, we're, we're not, um, we can't refer to itself, but we can refer to a placeholder, and we make it recursive by applying y to it. So in other words, um, yeah, so the y of fib1 is um, a true recursive function. Now, interestingly, if we just simply make the substitution, x is y of fib1 in the first equation, we get the same right-hand side. Which, which kind of means the left-hand side's equal, which means fib1 of y fib1 is y fib1. Um, and, if, and for this reason, uh, the y combinator is known as a fixed-point combinator. And if you go through the details, it turns out this is the only property we actually need. Uh, if, it's, if f y of f is y of f, then, um, then y will turn any sort of pseudo-recursive function into a recursive function. I'm sorry, I'm just making up terms on the fly. I don't know what the real names of these things are. I, I just say proto-recursion, pseudo-recursion. I, I don't know what you're supposed to call these things. <laughs> um, and then we, we ended up with y because we went, went through a particular strategy to, uh, to double up the placeholders. And so, again, history is messy, and so it turns out why, why in fact, there was another fixed-point combinator uh, that predates Y, and that's called, the, uh, it was by Turing in 1937, and we can derive it right now using our techniques. So we want a theta Y that satisfies this equation. Th sorry, we want a theta combinator that satisfies this equation. Theta Y is Y of theta Y. And uh, we just use, introduce a placeholder and to double up the placeholder on the right-hand side and then pass the function to itself and then we end up with uh, what Turing got. And that was the first published fixed-point combinator which enables a recursion. So, <laughs> I, I don't know if you caught all that, but to, but to sum up, you know, to, if you have a recursive definition, to compile it, um, 
You, you just uh, introduce placeholders and then apply Y to it. And here's, here's an excerpt from my compiler, uh, one version of my compiler that does this. It just searches through the, the syntax tree to see if, if it's a recursive one or not. And if it is, then it turns the name of the function itself into a variable, uh, which is how I made it. It's, it, it. The name of the function itself becomes the placeholder, and then you apply Y to it. And if for some reason this happens before the type checking phase, uh, that's okay. You just tell the type checker that Y has this type and then it works out. And, and um, in practice, although you can write Y in terms of other combinators we've seen before, uh, it's kind of a hassle to do, reduce all that just to do recursion. So I, I actually special case it and, um, uh, with, with, the, with the key property that you need from, the, from Y. And <clears throat> so it's probably a misnomer to call it Y in my code, but whatever. And, 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 and ultimately, you, you can also cheat, because when, you, when you're writing compilers, you have the memory addresses of, of the functions you're compiling, and you can sort of just break out of the theory and, and just use memory addresses uh, at, at certain points. Oh, yeah, so here's a, um, an example, so if you, which I which we went through before, actually you saw uh, <laughs> my compiler do before, which is, um, the, so we hear that fact n equals, oh, well, yeah, yeah, you saw that. Um, so um, the, the if and then else statements, um, as Andreas mentioned yesterday, are, are really, um, it's just a case match on a Boolean type. And we're using Scott, the Scott encoding, so uh, we, we just, that's just Scott encoding of a data type and a case expression. Um, and then we, we turn it into a sort of a pseudo, recursive function, which we then apply y to, and then lastly we apply the bracket abstraction, and that's how you end up from a rec recursive definition to a, um, a bunch of combinators that can be run on a, um, on a VM. And in fact, this is the program that you saw earlier on, on that animated VM thing. And uh, as a further step, which is optional, you can also convert what you got back into Haskell and confuse people. <laughs> Oh, and, oh, yeah, I just wanted to add that um, it's probably obvious to everyone, but um, the, the chicken and egg problem really is truly difficult. And um, because you could argue that, well, the GHC is just running the GHC on its source, so can't we use a fixed point combinator to, to magically create a GHC binary out of its source? And, but, uh, but that's not true, because although it does find a solution, there, there is a sense in how it's, it's sort of a superficial solution, and so you get undefined and you don't get a GHC binary. Uh, so, so if you want to bootstrap a, a, comp a compiler, you really do have to do real work. You have to start from another language, compile something, and then uh, improve, add an, write another compiler, and compile, compile that, and then gradually improve the, um, your compilers as you go. All right, okay. So the, here we go. Um, I forgot about this slide. So, so as before, we, I mentioned that uh, VMs are really simple. We, we, I even showed you an excerpt of the code. It was just a bunch of one-liners in a case expression. And, um, and for that reason, it's easy to compile the VM to WASM, which also means it's really easy to run Haskell on the web. So, <clears throat> those are, so the, the example, examples from before, I really could have anyone pick a, a formula, because it was, cause the same person would have worked out the example on paper and then carefully typed it into their slide program to show, but I didn't do that. I, I, I have a program running in the background that actually figures out the right answer. So, for instance, I, so you can give it any formula, and it'll tell you how to write it with, um, uh, without any logical symbols. Uh, like here's a, yeah, just, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to prove I'm not making this up, but <laughs> uh, I don't know, for all C exists D, uh, something, like, oops, will that work? Yeah, <laughs> well, and then, <laughs> So it was actually, I wasn't, I wasn't kidding when you could have, when I said pick any formula. This is actually pretty cool. No, no, sorry, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, I'm glad you said that, because if you like that, you're gonna love the next slide. Because so, then, um, yeah, so you can put, uh, what is this, what, what do you call this thing? Again, uh, this, these Sean Tinkles tricks into code and run them on the web, but then you can also put the compiler on the web. So. So this is actually a live co a compiler right now that you can uh, type code in and it'll compile and run it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, here, I like fibs in this format. The zip with zero, oh wait, <laughs> plus tail. Not yet, fibs, tail fibs. There, I memorized it. Okay. <laughs> and then, I don't know, fibs 10. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a... Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and that actually, I do have multiple um, arbitrary precision arithmetic, which I implemented myself using real, just, just the, um, the naive algorithms, I guess, but it works. Um, and then, if you're wondering, well, now that I have a Haskell compiler on the web that you can run on the browser, uh, you can go a, a tiny bit further, and that's this slideshow. Because if you look at this web page, what it actually does is load a Haskell compiler by the binary, and then it compiles a bunch of code, and then runs a slideshow written in Haskell, which you're seeing right now. And, and, this, and I kind of went overboard with this. I, I, I wrote some code to, to do HTML markup, and uh, formula parsers, and NAND rewriter, bracket abstraction, and so on. And, and, and so was the, uh, the VM you saw. That, that was actually a web page that loads a Haskell compiler and then compiles the contents of the page. And just to show you, here's the, here's the source of the page. So there's the... <laughs> Uh, that's that's the, the tree data structure at the beginning that holds all the various formulas and also the HTML page format. <laughs> um, uh, the bracket abstraction code, um, parser combinators, um, logic formula parsers. Uh, what else is there? And there's, there's those tricks I showed, and there's the first few slides. And then if we go too far, there'll be spoilers. So I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> don't want to scroll that much. No, hang on. So let's uh, just get out of here. I think I've made a function to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. So that's the. Um, I'll go back to more demos if, if uh, we have time. But <laughs> but I just wanted to say that um, it's actually way easier than it looks um, because there's a lot of fantastic free literature out there. Oh, well, the last one isn't. But the, um, the rest of it, you can just find these papers online. And a lot of them have just Haskell code in there, or, or, or well, in um, Ola Kizyob's case, it was OCaml code. And, and you can just easily translate it and cotton, and copy and paste things around. And I found really the only part I needed to think was um, with the designing the combinator reducing VM, which we've already seen wasn't that complicated. And, and here's, um, just if you're curious, this is what one of my compilers looks like. It's, uh, so this is fairly early in the bootstrapping stage. There's no, it doesn't, you can't do recursion, you can't do, um, you can't do data types really, you can't do, uh, well, yeah, you can see. Uh, it, it, you can still have, you have direct access to the combinators, the ones with the at sign in them. Um, and I, I sort of manually scot and code things in my head so, so I know how to write these functions. And, and oh yeah, here's another one, here's a data de declaration. Because I don't have data declarations, I have to write this, the Scott encoding myself out. And, um, and so there's the prelude, the syntax tree, and here's the parser combinators. And because at this stage, there's definitely no type classes or anything, um, these fmap app, they only mean, they, they, they're only the um, parser combinator instance of them. Um, but it's not too bad. It, it's, um, <laughs> Well, well, maybe I'm too used to these things. <laughs> but, but, it, but, but it wasn't that much work to write a parser combinator library, even in such restrictive, with my hands tied behind my back, basically. And there's the Lexa. So the first one's a comment, the next one's a space. I mean, if you, if you know parser combinators, it, I, I think this might make some sense to you. You can see um, uh, anyone is any char. I, I don't know why I called it anyone. And um, well, any one car, I guess. But <laughs> and a variable is, let's see, a space followed by something that satisfies so that's something that's between A and Z. So you can only use lowercase. Because, oh, the, sorry, yeah, the hash symbol denotes the immediate. Like, that's, a, that's that character A and that the character Z. That, that's the quoting mechanism. And uh, here's the parser. Um, a program is a bunch of definitions. A definition is a, um, a bunch of stuff separated by equal signs and so on. And lastly, uh, that's the rest of the compiler. It, um, if you pass something and um, convert it, oh yeah, <laughs> um, B ab stands for um, bracket abstraction, which causes unlambda un helper, which is just the SK algorithm that I showed earlier with one optimization in it. And um, I can't, what, what's is free for? Oh yeah, you need is free in that for the optimization. And then, and other than that, it's, it, it just prints stuff in the right order. And, and the output looks like this, which is sort of bytecode for my um, combinator interpreter. And I've used that Polish notation trick. So the, the, the backtick here means application. And you can see all the S and K and I combinators. And I've sprinkled with little bits and pieces, um, which re refer to uh, Im immediate values. And also, um, yeah, once again, sharing rears its head. So, because this, remember, it's not really one single expression. It, it's, a, it's actually, it's not just a tree, it's a directed acyclic graph. So, there has to be some way of jumping um, from place to place. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Is, is, is there time left over? Yeah, please. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, okay, well, I, I said if there was time left over, then I'd show how that uh, a better kind of, um, bracket abstraction algorithm works. And here uh, I have a, um, yeah, pick a term, any lambda term. and 
I'm going to make the variables disappear again, but I think you'll be really disappointed this time, because all I'm doing is uh, the brown indexes, <laughs> which is just the level of nesting of a variable. Um, uh, hopefully, you're all familiar with that. <clears throat> um, but the reason I want to show this trick is because there's, there's something interesting when you write uh, lambdas with the brown ind indices, and that's, you can, you, can, you can sort of make sense of a lambda term that doesn't have any lambdas in it. Like if I just write down xz of y of z, and then it, it, it's hard to know what that means, because if, depending on how you um, add lambda abstractions later on, depending on the enclosing context, it can mean very different things. But if you start with something like 2, 0, 1, 0, and no matter how, and then add a bunch of lambdas to it, it's always going to mean the same thing. And I, and I think this was um, uh, I, uh, the Kieselyov's insight in, in making a bracket abstraction algorithm. Because then, um, okay, I'm, <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I'm not sure this, this is going to make sense, but, but um, oh yeah, maybe I'll skip, I'll skip this part. These slides, uh, it, it doesn't matter so much. It, it, this is sort of the thing you do really have to read papers for. But, but, the, but the summary is that, <clears throat> since, thanks to the brown indices, uh, um, you can make sense of uh, bits and pieces of lambda terms that you, wouldn't, that you couldn't otherwise, and that empowers an algorithm. That, that, uh, that allows an algorithm that, that, looks, that can sort of paste, uh, paste little bits together and figure out the, the, the final expression. Because all other bracket abstractions um, don't do this. They, they actually look at the variable names and try and figure out where was this variable defined, and, and then because of that, um, I, I think they're not as effective. Um, and what else do I want to say about this? Oh yes, <laughs> and oh, yeah, I, I did want to mention that um, uh, one, one really fun part of running your own Haskell compiler is you can just you know pick the there's no religious walls you you, you win every time. <laughs> so, so for example, I I wanted a I, for multiple commas multiple tuples. I decided that that was going to be syntax sugar for um, uh, nested um, pairs. And that way, you can have one instance handling all tuples at once, because uh, one thing that annoyed me in the... I'm, I'm sure you all have seen that, 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 that um, some instances have many declarations just for lots of tuples, and if you add one more, it won't work. <laughs> and I also, for another example, it's like, I, I really like having a ring type class instead of a num type class. I, I, I'm kind of... Uh, mathematically minded, and I, I don't, I don't like how I don't, I don't like this, how num is ring with just a little bit more stuff, because then it doesn't make sense for certain things like Gaussian integers. And Gaussian integers, I think, are quite practical for 2D games, because um, sometimes I want to, I have a tile I want to rotate or something, and I can never remember. Oh, you got to uh, take the x coordinate, make it to the y coordinate, and that kind of I can't remember the rules, but it, I can always remember multiply by i, and and so I, I, I find it quite useful. Um, <laughs> And I, and I have just little, t really silly nitpicks, like I like uh, empty lambda to foo, to mean foo, and I, I, have, uh, I have these turned on, in fact you can't turn them off, these uh, extensions. <laughs> and, and it's also, it, it does type checking the way I want, which is, I don't generalize let, and uh, you, you can, you can uh, declare the, the type of a, 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 um, of a let declaration and it will respect it, but, in, but when it's an in infer, if you don't, if you leave it undeclared, if you don't annotate it, it won't generalize. And there's no dreaded monomorphism restriction. <laughs> um, oh yes, <laughs> and another thing is, I, I, was, I was hoping, I found the process of it to be a lot like playing one of those uh, games like um, Factorial and Minecraft, where you have to, uh, you start, it's like a survival game where you start with very little and you have to build your way up to Haskell 98. And I'm wondering, is there a way to make, <laughs> to make this more formal? Could, could there be a game where, where, where you could say, okay, everyone, you start with nothing, go build a Haskell compiler. And I think that'd be really fun because it's, it's, it's a lot easier than, than, than it seems, I think. Um, and, then, and, then, and the main reason I wanted it to happen is so I can watch YouTube speedrunning videos on this. Because <laughs> I really love watching those things, and I'm sure there's a lot, more, a lot of cool tricks that, that are out there that I just haven't found yet. And here are my own tips if you want to try this. <laughs> and it's, uh, for the parts, I just use parser combinators because it's really easy to get a small library working. And I guess eventually you may want to use a more theoretically sound thing, but yeah, I haven't got there yet. And um, for the tree decoration problem, um, I would just hold my nose and I, I, would, I just held my nose and just use one tree for everything because you don't yeah you just, it just takes too long writing different very similar tree definitions and, sh and shuttling between them and then, and you don't have a type system that can that can automate a lot of it for you. Um, 
Oh, one thing I made a mistake was pattern matching because I, I didn't have pattern matching in my language and then I tried to add the full thing and it's very awkward to, to write um, a pretty complex code without pattern matching. So it, it's better to write a, a poor pattern matcher first and, and build your way up, which is probably obvious, but I, it wasn't to me. Um, I also should have supported offside, the offside rule way earlier because that, that was... Uh, <laughs> that, was, uh, that, was, that was way more helpful than I thought it would be. And um, uh, yeah, just other little things. Um, oh, fixity. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I originally thought fixity is pretty annoying to deal with because you have to pass an expression without knowing any of the operator's fixities. And so I thought, oh, I'll make my life simpler and assume all fixities declarations are at the beginning. I'll, I'll make the user you know, um, write programs that way. And then I can have my parser know all the fixities. But um, I found it's actually quite annoying to do that too, because now you have to thread the fixity table through the parser. And it's way better just to do the full general version, which is you pass an expression, uh, assume the, the, the expression, uh, operators have a certain fixity, and then you have a separate phase, once you know the fixities, to go through and, and rejigger all the trees to the correct fixities. And, and um, yeah, and modules, I really should have thought about it way earlier because uh, it's still quite wrong in, I, I, <laughs> in my compiler, which, um, yeah, which luckily we haven't run into yet. Um, and, my, and my last slide is, uh, I, some, of, some of you may know that I, uh, yeah, I entered the uh, International Obfuscated C Code Contest in 2019 uh, with a Haskell compiler, and that's because... Um, and then, uh, then, and there, I just, uh, you can look at my website for the full tricks, but, but basically the rules are you can have at most 4K bytes and at most 2,000 tokens, but they have uh, 2,053 tokens, but they have interesting tokenization rules, so you can encode stuff into white space characters and, and braces and things like that. <laughs> and, and so basically I, I wrote a, a compiler that with no type checking, very, very limited syntax, but, but, but enough that it can compile in GHC. And um, uh, yeah, I would encode the data into using, exploiting the, the, the counting rules. And I use Huffman to compress things a bit further and base 85 to avoid high bit characters. Um, yeah, I guess that's about all I wanted to say. And unless then you want to see more demos or something, <laughs> or, or um, animations of combinators. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. One sec. Let me just go, oh, go sorry, and get sorry. the mic. Yeah. Oh, that's good. We can meet halfway. Yeah. Thanks. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for an amazing talk. Um, that's probably one of the best talks I've seen in the last two or three years. Um, so a little context, I'm the owner of uh, www.combinatorylogic.com. Uh, <laughs> I'm a massive uh, combinatory logic fan. Um, also a huge fan of your blog. So my, I got two questions. My first is, I'm not sure if you recall the APL and J blog oh, that you wrote. Yeah, I, I did write the J interpreter once, yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, moonlighting here at, at a Haskell conference. I'm, I'm also a huge array language fan. Uh -huh. um, you, you mentioned in that blog that uh, I believe the S combinator sort of maps to the reader instance, which you said, but are you aware that, um, or sorry, what they call hook and fork in J. Yes. Uh, are you aware that hook and fork map to the S combinator and the Phi Combinator, and I just gave a talk like a week ago on Monday at Lambda Days that like points out that array languages are the best programming languages, in my opinion, for programming with combinators because uh, Ken Iverson in 1989 published a paper uh, called Phrasal Forms where he basically t references Curry's work and says, we're gonna throw all this stuff in array languages, but then he <laughs> renames it all and that's the last time you ever hear of it. Anyways, just curious because you just gave this amazing talk, and you also have dabbled in the array languages. Did you know about that connection? Yes, I did. I, I did know about the S one. The, the, that's, I think I mentioned it earlier, the app instance of reader. That's, mm -hmm. That is, uh, I mean, that is the same as the J's um, hook, common, uh, not yeah. hook. Uh, hook, yeah. <laughs> is it hook, the one, the, the one where you, the, you put three operators together? Um, uh, it's uh, a two train, okay. so two, the juxtaposition of two functions in yeah. J, yeah. Okay, um, okay, yeah, I, I think I, I was aware of that, yes. Okay, second question. Yep. Uh, you added R, so like um, mm -hmm. uh, Curry published his textbook in 1958, and in chapter five, he lists five of the combinators as elementary combinators. Uh -huh. um, 
And I think basically B, I, C, and K uh, are four of those five, W is the other one, and then you added S. So I'm, am I correct in thinking that you added R just so that you had a nice word to spell, or do you oh, also have like a fondness for <laughs> no, R? Not quite, because R is CC, and then in my VM, you would have to, it would have to allocate a new app cell on the stack just to undo it again, because it would, it, it, it's better, uh, it, would, it would do more work in, in, in the inner loop, basically. So I, so I was rather, because I knew CC would pop up all the time, so I just made one comment for it. And I didn't make up R, it came from a, a, another source, I think, a, a Smullyan or somebody defined it. And, um, I, and so that's perfect, I can claim it's a basic combinator now. You know? Okay, so you, <laughs> you borrowed it from someone else. Yes. Anyways, thank you once again, this talk was amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>